Exodus chapter 3, turn there. But I, I was going to preach. I had this idea in me of God gives us a new name. And this, this is more of a teaching, encouragement, inspiration type message than it is I'm going to beat the fire out of you and get you down to the altar message. I think as born again believers, as people of the Bible, people of, that belong to Jesus Christ, I don't think there's anything that we have to be ashamed of when it comes to Bible Christianity. Can I hear you say amen? Now, some dirty, rotten, evil things have been done in the name of religion. And, here's the theme, have been done in the name of the Lord. Ezekiel spoke against the prophets who prophesy, God said they prophesy falsely in my name, saying, peace, peace, and there is no peace. God said, I never said that. Those are things that I did not say. And if you ever get confused about whether God is speaking or God is not speaking, turn to the Word of God. It's going to be in there. If God says it, somebody say amen. That's just how it is with me. I've, I've looked at other ways and just kind of floated around there for a while in my life and settled on the idea that this Bible is either right or I'm going to call it quits and go home and do something else. But this Bible is right. It is the Word of God. And it bears God's name in it. And I want you to think, this, this message went from preaching about our name and our new name that we have in Christ to a study of the, the name of the Lord. Now, I know this might sound like I'm going back to the, to the commandments that said, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain, but I'm not actually doing that because it's, it's not a chastisement about how you ought not say God this and God that in your everyday speech or when you're angry or when something goes wrong, you ought not take God's name in vain. I believe in that. Amen? It's supposed to taste like soap when you do that. And trust me, this woman made me eat soap one night, one day. I didn't like it at all. That's not child abuse. That's parent abuse. I was abusing her with, with, my, with my behavior. But this, I don't, know, I don't know how this is going to sound. I don't know if I can convey to you the joy I got out of studying this. And trust me, I left a vast majority of what the Bible says about it out of the message. But I want to tell you something. God's name is his honor, it is his character. Uh, what is it they say about a, a man's name? Um, well, I'm trying to remember. I can't, think of, I can't think of the saying. Maybe there isn't one. But a man's name, when it's brought up in a conversation, when people talk about you, as they mention your name, that is going to elicit in somebody some sort of emotional respo uh, response. Whether when your name is brought up, they talk about you in favor and say, yeah, I know, I know them, R great, great person. I've known them for years. Like, like you hear me talk about Tim Barron's, some of the preachers that I have looked up to in my life. I talk well of them. Um, when I bring their name up or when somebody says, do you know, do you know Brother Reg Kelly? Yeah, I know Reg Kelly. I love that man. He's one of my friends. Um, when somebody brings his name up to me, I, I, don't, I don't say a bad word about him because I love him. However, there are names 
that I'll be honest with you, I just soon you not bring up to me. And I'm not going to tell you who they are because I don't, I don't want to bring them up. But they have, these people have a reputation with me that is not favorable. And it's by way of their actions, by way of their deeds, by the way the things that, that I know them for, the things that they have done, things that I have encountered with them, things that I know about them. And there's just some people I just, I just don't, I just don't mention. But when it comes to God, God's name is His glory. God's name is His honor. God's name is His character. And I believe there's glory in the name of the Lord. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 13. Again, I don't know how this message is going to come out. I, I don't know if I can convey to you the, the simple joy that I got out of studying this. But I'm going to give you the word of God and I'm going to sit down and be quiet and let you think about it for a while. You do your own study. Uh, if you type in the word name in a King James Bible search engine or look it up in a Strong's Concordance, my goodness, there was thousands of places where the word name was used in the Bible. And everybody is known individually by their name. If I describe for you uh, somebody in this church who's tall, uh, kind of gray-headed, a little goofy-looking. Who would you say I was talking about? <laughs> well, I was actually thinking of somebody else. I wasn't talking. See, that's the confusion. But if I said, John Cooley... Well, you know, John, now you may not say, well, I don't think he's goofy looking. Right, John? Right, John? Yeah, we're off the air now. But I mention his name. If I go to people in this church that he does work for, I mention John Cooley, they say, yeah, I love John. John's a good man. John stands for this church. John labors for this church. He labors for the people here. And as far as I'm concerned, his name is in good favor with me. You can talk about John all you want to. That's the way it is with God. Just because some people have dragged God's name through the mud, just because some people, just because some people despise God. I, I, there was one man on the internet, I watch his videos every now and then, but I, I, I did not like what he said. He's an obvious atheist, and he's a, he pretends to be this man of great reason, but he said, I don't care if you believe in your sky wizard up in heaven with a long gray beard. That's how he referred to our God. And I think our God has got something to say back to him one of these days when he stands in front of him. That's like standing in front of a judge in a court of law and saying, Judge, you're an idiot. What will that get you? What's the sentence for contempt of court in Jefferson County? How many days? You haven't tried it yet, have you? You don't know by experience, you don't know. That's what I'm talking about. The name, it not only bothers me to say or to take God's name in vain, when I hear somebody else do it, it bothers me. Years ago, in my youth, I used to watch, stay up and watch Saturday Night Live. I like comedy. And they got to where it seemed like every three or four weeks, they were bringing somebody out dressed up like Jesus Christ, mocking him and make fun of him. And about the third time they did it, I shut it off and I said, God, I am not, I, I won't watch that ever again. I haven't watched it since then. They can make jokes and I like to laugh at good jokes. I like to try to be funny every now and then. But don't make fun of my Savior. Amen. That, to me, that's about as bad as spitting on the, the unknown soldier's grave. 
you don't do that in this country. You don't burn our flag. You don't dishonor our police. You don't dishonor our military. Somebody say amen. And you don't talk about God in vain. Exodus 3.13, Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say, Look at what it says. What is his name? What shall I say unto them? God led Moses to ask that question. God is going to be known by his people by his name. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And to me, that message is a, it's like a, it's like a name that doesn't have a beginning and it, it's a sentence that doesn't have a beginning and doesn't have an end. It's just there and it's always there and it's eternal. I am that I am. And all of that is present tense language. God is always God. He always was God. He always will be God. Somebody say amen. I am that I am. And he said, thus says, shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Moses knew that if he was going to have any sway and any respect or any authority over God's people, he would have to come to him in the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their fathers. If he'd have gone to them in the name of Pharaoh, or gone to them, they hated Pharaoh. If he'd have gone to them in the name of Pharaoh or Baal or some other God, at that time, I don't think they would have trusted him. But he said, go in the name of I am. I am sent you. In verse 15, God said, moreover unto Moses, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. That's, that's his name also. Multiple names for God in the Bible. The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This, watch this, this is my name. For how long? Forever. And this is my memorial. Think about it. Think of what he's saying. How many names, my memorial unto all generations. How many names do we know out of history? American history, George Washington, one of the founding fathers of our nation, Benjamin Franklin, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, John F. Kennedy, Ronald Reagan, Donald Trump. How many names are famous in this nation? And they abide long after the man has died. They, those names still abide. And when those names are brought up in certain circles, those names are still honored amongst Americans. Yeah, let's go to prayer. Uh, pray for, we got some folks that are sick. David and Emily, I think, are out this morning. Uh, Matthew and Paige are on vacation, but I think they're coming back today, so you pray for them. And uh, just pray for the message this morning. I just mean to inspire you and encourage you this morning. Father, I pray, Lord, you'd bless the words that are spoken this morning out of my frail, humble mouth. Lord, there's no way, God, that I can speak with the distinction and the honor that your name bears. There's no way, God, that I can uh, give to these people the glory, the absolute glory and power that your name uh, brings to bear. But, Father, at the name of Jesus, even devils of hell shuddered in fear when they heard that Jesus, the Son of the Most High God, was in town. They knew that their God their, their creator was around and they feared him the way we should fear him and honor him this morning. And Father, help us, dear God, in our hearts to recognize, God, that we should not fear taking the name of the Lord in our lives. We should not fear bearing the name of Jesus Christ in our identity. We are Christians. We believe and follow Jesus Christ. We follow what he said. We follow his teachings we are recipients of his everlasting life, and we will worship and praise him forever and all eternity. So, Father, I pray, Lord, you'd bless this message. Let it be an encouragement, inspiration to the people of God this morning. And, Father, let it inspire those, Lord, who don't know you the way we know you, who haven't been taught what we've been taught. Lord, that somebody out there might hear a message on the name of the Lord and having lived their life in blasphemy 
and in unrighteousness, Father, turn to you and follow the great name of I am that I am. Blessed be the name of the Lord and bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Notice back in verse 14, God, this is God, God, himself, God, saying unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, tell the Jews that I am has sent me. Now this was a phrase that I'm certain they were familiar, the Jews were familiar with all the way up until the time that Jesus came. And in John chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus then identified himself with that name. If there was ever any question in your mind that Jesus is God Almighty, I'm here to tell you that He is because He told the Jews who some of them believed it, some of them loved it, the rest of them rent their clothes, they tore their clothes in anger and said, this man speaks blasphemy. When Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. And they knew exactly what He was saying. He was making himself, and Paul said it this way, he thought it not robbery to be or make himself equal with God. Because he was God. He was God in this world. He was God manifest in the flesh. He was God Almighty. And as I said a while ago in the prayer, even the devils of hell knew that he was God. They knew it. They knew that Jesus, the Son of the Most High God, was himself God and they feared him. One thing that bothers me about this. Excuse me. I, I try not to squeak. But it's better than it coming down my lip, all right? I'm just... One thing about this always bothered me. If you look in the NIV, and probably some of the newer translations, they have rendered here, instead of I am that I am, they have in here what Popeye said, I am what I am. That's ignorant. That's childish. That's stupid. I am what I am. Paul even said that, by the grace of God, I am what I am. But Paul never said, I am that I am. Because us humans are not God, we will never be God, and we should not take the name of God that way in vain. Somebody say amen. Now, Isaiah chapter 42, verse 5. This message should be easy for me to get through, because all I got is scripture for you. Isaiah 42, verse 5. You might want to turn there. Thus saith God the Lord. Now remember, you underline this and make this note in your Bible. Anytime you see in the King James, capital L-O-R-D, in all capital letters, that denotes that in the Hebrew, you had God's four-letter name in Hebrew, yod Hey va Hey, which is transliterated into Jehovah. Now, there is a branch of cultish, Christianity it calls themselves the sacred name movement. And they make stupid sayings like the real name of God is not Jehovah because there was no letter J in Hebrew. That's stupid. I don't speak Hebrew. I speak English. I don't do that well sometimes, but I speak it. And we got a letter J in our alphabet. And that's the first letter for Jesus. And that's the first letter for Jehovah. And I'm going to say it. That's his name. I don't, have, I don't have a contravening authority that tells me that God's name is any other name. His name, according to my King James Bible, is Jehovah God. And that's what you have when you have the capital L-O-R-D. Now you might ask, why did they write then, why did they write the word Lord? And I'm going to tell you, you're going to need this because somebody on Facebook is going to try to trip you up on this. Am I right? They're going to try to mess your head up and say, oh, the King James is bad. They changed God's name. They took Jehovah out, you know, thousands of times. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. Not even Jesus himself would have fallen for that. Jesus himself, when he quoted the Old Testament from Hebrew to Greek, when Jesus spoke that word, yod heh vah when he spoke it, he himself said the Greek word kyrios, which means Lord. Every place in the New Testament 
where it's quoting an Old Testament verse where you have the capital L-O-R-D in all capital letters. Every time in the Greek New Testament, it is the word Lord. His name is the Lord our God. Somebody say amen. And look what the Lord did. Thus saith the Lord God the Lord, He that created the heavens. Can you show me another God that can create the heavens and stretch them out? He that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it. Can you show me another God that can create? He that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. Can you show me another God that can breathe life into a person? Can you show me another God? Can you give me another name by which life can come into a human being? No, you can't. Can you give me another name of another God that can give man a soul? No, you cannot. And he said in verse 6, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand. I'm going to ask you this morning, are you holding the hand of the Lord your God? Or are you holding on to another God? I'm the Lord that will hold your hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes. Can you name for me another God who came to this earth and opened the eyes of those that were blind? To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. You say, did that happen? Paul got out, didn't he? Who set him free? Jesus Christ, the Lord our God. I am the Lord. That is my name. Look at what he says. And my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. That's why I say when you go into one of them churches, got one of them statues of Jesus up doing this or doing this or whatever it is he's doing, that is not our God. You don't bow and pray to a statue. You don't bow and pray to some idol. That idol cannot hear your prayers. That idol cannot speak for you. That idol cannot save you. That idol cannot walk with you. Only God can do that. And that is His name, the Lord. That's why He said in Exodus 20, verse 7, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So yeah, I did throw the commandment in here. Which means that you don't go around either publicly or privately or in your heart. Use God's name in vain. You don't go around saying, Oh my God. Not unless you're going to sing, Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder. Amen. For the Lord will, listen to what he said, For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. In Leviticus 19, 12, he tells you what he means by that. He says, ye shall not swear by my name falsely. What is it that people all the time say, Cubby, when, they, when you used to ask them, did you have drugs in your car? No, I swear to God I don't. Had they ever said that to you? That makes me madder than when they say, I swear on my mother's grave. Yeah, your mother's dead. But the God that you swore by isn't. And he had said, Angel, write that down. He took my name in vain. Because nine times out of ten when they say, I swear to God there's not. What are you going to find, cubby? Drugs. Paraphernalia. They're lying through their teeth. And God said, you should not swear by my name falsely. They used to in this country, I don't know if they still do in some courtrooms, you used to put your hand on a Bible. Amen? Put your hand on the Bible. You solemnly swear or firm you'll tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help you, God. That's what they used to say in a courtroom. That's because there was a time when everybody knew that if you lied and you put God's name, you swore to God you wouldn't lie that God was going to get you for it. People are not afraid of the Lord anymore. Neither shalt thou profane the name of, the God, of thy God. I am the Lord. He, he put his name on his commandment. And our God, a man is known by his sayings. A, a man is known by his deeds. 
A man is known by his character and our God is known by the words that comes out of his mouth and those words do not come out in vain. In 1 Kings chapter 8, Solomon is praying the dedication prayer over the temple that God allowed him to build. And I want you to notice, if you would turn to 1 Kings 8, I want you to notice what Solomon said in his wisdom that God gave him, what Solomon said about the temple of the Lord. He said in 1 Kings 8, verse 16, you can also find this, I believe, in um, 2 Chronicles maybe there's a dual witness to it but he said since the day that I brought forth my people Israel out of Egypt I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel to build a house that my name watch this that my name might be therein his name is in his house if you look up on the screen I've written Bethel up there a little weird I've separated it out the way it actually is. Beth is a Hebrew word that means house. Uh, Bet David means house of David. Bet Israel means the house of Israel. Bet El, El is the Hebrew word for God. Beth El means house of of God. God put his name in his house. And I want you to place this in your mind and your heart this morning. Are you ashamed to tell people you go to Bethel? I hope not. Because God has put his name in this place. He didn't have to. God knows we don't deserve it. None of us. But by his mercy and his grace, he chose to put his name in this place. I didn't name this church. And years ago, there was a time that that wasn't what this church was named. It was reorganized after a church split in the 60s. And God sent a pastor to bring the two groups back together. And they used to meet out on Gamble Cemetery Road, right where A Highway is right now. And uh, that's why we're here. And ever since then, it was called Bethel, the house of God. He said in verse 17, he said, It was in the heart of David my father to build a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And the Lord said unto David my father, Where it was, whereas it was in thine heart to build a house unto my name, thou didst dwell, thou didst well that it was in thine heart. Nevertheless, thou shalt not build the house. But thy son that shall come forth out of thy loins, he shall build the house unto, unto my name. His name is not only in us, but when it says unto, the house is unto God. Which means, God, this house is for God and God alone. We don't have bingo card meetings here. We don't shoot dice down in the basement like I caught some of Festus PD's finest doing one day, playing poker down in the church basement. One of their guys was getting married here, and the guys, they were doing a wedding rehearsal, and the guys from the Festus PD, his buddies, was downstairs playing poker, and I walked down on it, and I'm just biting my tongue. Get that stuff out of here. Ugh. But in this house, nothing else should be done except it be done unto the Lord and unto his name. So in verse 29, Solomon was talking about praying unto God in this place. And he said, That thine eyes may be open toward this house night and day even toward the place of which thou hast said, My name shall be there, that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. What is it the Bible says? My house shall be called a house of prayer for who? All people. All people. His house is a house of prayer. 
Now, what is the real? We call this the house of God. It is in as far as it's a building made with hands. But what is the real house of God in this world? It is us. Which means that God has not only set His name inside of you, written it in your heart, which is why it does bother you when people go around using God's name and Jesus Christ's name in vain. It bothers you. Why? Because God's name is in you. That name is special to you. But God is not only, He's built a house in you unto His name. Paul said in Ephesians 2, For we are His workmanship, created unto uh, God, unto created, we are His workmanship, created by God, unto good works. That means when God puts His name in you, God carries out His will in your life as well. You are the product of what God has done. 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. Watch this now. This is a verse very well known. In fact, let's say it out loud. Open your Bible up there if you want to. Underline it. 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. Let's say it out loud. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Wouldn't you like God to heal the land of America? Say amen. There was a time... And you can find it in the writings of our American founding fathers that the men of this country, John Adams, George Washington, even, even Benjamin Franklin, who at best believed in God, but he wasn't a Christian by any means. Man was an, he was a known philanderer and a drunkard. But he was wise when it came time for them to meet and, and write the Constitution of the United States. And they came at an impasse. They could, not, they could not finish writing the Constitution. They were arguing. They were fighting. And it was Ben Franklin who stood up and said, My brethren and my fellow Americans, if we believe that not even a sparrow can fall out of the heavens without God's knowledge of it, how is it that we think that we can begin a nation without God? creating it and building it. And so Ben Franklin made a motion that all of the men of that, con of that Constitutional Congress go to their homes, call upon their ministers, and spend days with their ministers in fasting and prayer. You know what they did? Exactly that. And out of that, they came back and drew up for our nation the document that we honor second most in this country aside from the Bible, and that is the Constitution of the United States, which in part says, Congress shall enact no law establishing any religion nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Somebody say amen. I believe God put his name in his land. Psalm 91.10. This is about how God protects people. He said, there shall, verse 10, There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee. That's, that's where you get the understanding that we do have guardian angels. How many of you have had your life saved by an angel? You believe that? Raise your hand. Me. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt, not, thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder. He's talking about devils. The young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he has set his love upon me. Therefore, now, now God's talking. Because he, you, have set your love upon God. Because he set his love on me. Therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high. Because he hath what? Known my name. And his name is not Pope. It's not even Hillary. <laughs> or Sleepy Joe. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high 
because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. Doesn't it give you joy in your heart to know that when you pray, God hears it? And God's going to answer you. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. And I will tell you something. If you claim to know God, then you'll know his salvation. You'll know what the gospel really is. Somebody say amen. Malachi chapter 1. Last book of the Old Testament. And I'm not kidding you. I typed in, and this is just how I study. God led me to, every one of these verses has the phrase, my name, in it. My name. And I got to reading all the verses. And you'd be glad that I don't have every one of them here on a PowerPoint. And I'm going to keep you until I get them all out. There's, I don't know, several hundred it seemed like. But I finally, I just said, man, I can't put too much more on this. Malachi 1.11, he said, For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. The Gentiles. The last book of the Old Testament, God is prophesying, saying, The Gentiles will know my name. And what is his name? Jesus Christ. Amen. My name shall be great among the Gentiles, and in every place incense shall be offered unto my name. When we finish a prayer, whether it's a public prayer, a private prayer, a, ma a prayer over your meals, a prayer before you go to work, a prayer while you're driving, a prayer while you're working, a prayer when you get home, a prayer before you go to bed at night, how do we end it? In Jesus' name. You know what that has now? It's got power, Gary. Gary said power. It's got power. When you mention the name of Jesus, devils flee. Amen? They cannot handle the name of Jesus, the Son of the Most High God. My name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. That's another one of his names. Now we go to Malachi 2 2. Watch this. God said, If you will not hear, and he's referring to what he's saying, if you'll not hear what I said, if you will not lay it to heart to give glory unto what? My name, saith the Lord of hosts. I will even send a curse upon you and will curse your blessings. You know how we say, oh, God bless you. God bless, and even lost people. God bless you. God bless you. That's you. God bless you. There was a guy in World War II when they invaded Germany and had put the German army down and he was one of them GIs that was stationed over Germany and stayed there for a while. He couldn't understand a word anybody was saying. He walked down the street in Berlin one day and he sneezed and somebody said, Gesundheit! He said, boy, I'm glad somebody knows English around here. That's a joke. Unto you that fear my name. Look at Malachi 4.2. Those who will not fear God's name, God will send a curse upon them. Yea, I have cursed them already because you do not lay it to heart. Do you think God doesn't know the outcome of your life? He does. And there are people in this world walking around cursed right now. Cursed and going to hell. And God knows it. Why? Because they wouldn't give you two cents for the name of the Lord. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. I think that means that you'll grow up taken very well care of and kept in safety because calves in the stall won't be killed by the wolves. Now the New Testament. Just think about verses where the phrase, my name is mentioned. This one came to mind. For where two or three are gathered together, how? In my name. 
Now, I've mentioned a while ago that the name Bethel means house of God. But we're not here gathered together in the name of a religious denomination. The fact of the matter is, we don't belong to one anymore. People say, what are you? Church. Bible-believing church. We're not gathered together in the name of the Baptist, the Free Will Baptist, the Southern Baptist, the Independent Baptist, General Baptist, American Baptist, Northern Baptist, some, something like 50 different breeds of Baptists in this country. We're not gathered together in the name of our church. We're not gathered together in the name of our congregation. We are gathered together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, when two or three, it doesn't have to be the pews full. It could be just three of us. And we've had that before when it would snow an inch. Right, Melissa? Minnesota people don't mind coming. But the Missouri people go, oh, it's bad out there. For where two or three gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Let me give you a picture of that. In Revelation chapter 1, John is praying and he's in the Spirit on the Lord's day. See, what day is it? That, got, that is God putting his... Did you know that the days of the week are named after other gods? Sunday, the God, sun god. Monday, the moon god. Tuesday or Tiwi's day, the name of a, I think it's a goddess. Wednesday, is, we pronounce it Wednesday, but it's actually derives from Woden's day. Wotan or Odin, the name of Odin, from the, the movie. Okay, Thor. His father was Odin. He was the god of all the Nordic nations. Thor's day is Thursday. Friday is a goddess a Nordic god is called Frigg. And Saturday is, guess whose day? Saturn's day. But notice that none of those names for the days are in your Bible. What did the Bible call this day? The Lord's day. You know what tomorrow is? Just say it. It's the Lord's, it's more the Lord's day. He owns it. Amen? There am I in the midst of them. So here's John on the Lord's day. And he's praying and he hears a voice behind him. And he turns to look and he sees seven golden candlesticks. Later on he says the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. And I think that represents the churches all over the world who have the seven spirits of God in them. Because in the tabernacle there was a candlestick with seven candles in it that represented the light of the Holy Ghost light comes on when you get saved that's the Holy Ghost and you telling you that you're right with God God seals you with that light by the way and so when John saw the seven golden candlesticks which represent the churches he said I saw one in the midst of them and it had his hair like wool White as snow. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And when Christ died on the cross, they put that crown of thorns on his head. That represented all of our sins. Like the priest used to touch the head of the scapegoat and transfer the sins of Israel to the head of that sacrificial lamb or goat. Transferring those sins. And when Christ was on the cross, He bore our sins for us. And they're no longer red like blood. They're white as snow. Somebody say amen. You didn't know that kind of stuff was in your Bible, did you? But Jesus was standing right in the midst of those seven candlesticks, wasn't He? Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Mark 9, 37. Remember that story when the, when the children came running to Jesus and his disciples got all indignant. Oh, this is an important man here. You kids go play somewhere. And Jesus said, let, let, let them be. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he said in Mark 9, 37, Whosoever shall receive one of such children, how? In my 
name. He receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me, receiveth not me, but him that sent me. You have God living in you. John chapter 14. If you would, somewhere in the blank, some, some blank page in your Bible, somewhere. Write these verse markings down. John 14, verses 13 through 14. John 14, verse 25 through 26. And I'll tell you why. I've said this before, but I went to college in the charismatic belt of America. Tulsa, Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Fort Smith and Dallas, Texas. They are full of wolves in sheep clothing. These charismatic false prophets. They're full of them. And I was so afraid of being labeled as being like them that we call them the name it, claim it crowd because that's what they are. Oh, I, I claim a new car in Jesus' name. That's foolishness. How can you eat a car when you're starving to death? How can you eat 10,000 to uh, toilet paper rolls when you buy them in bulk? You can't. But this verse, God helped me with. I read a book that Rose, Sister Rose gave to me. It was called Prayer, Asking, and Receiving. And this book, literally, because it was full of scripture, it changed my life. It was written by John R. Rice. And I read this verse, Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. I would say to that, well, he doesn't do everything we ask. What have I always said? That when we ask something of God in Jesus' name, He'll either give us exactly what we asked Him for, or do what? Give you something better. That you didn't even know you wanted or needed. But God knows. Now, you write that down because one of these days, the devil's going to hit you with, God doesn't answer your prayers. I've been there. God doesn't listen to you. God's not going to give you what you ask for. You're crazy. You're too bad. I know your sins. You're too rad for God to do anything like that. He said, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask anything in my name, I will do it, he said. So in verse 25, these things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send, how? In my name. He shall, that means the Holy Ghost bears the authority of God the Father and Jesus Christ. They really are one. Whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. You ought to get out on your knees every now and then and tell God, thank you. That you can ask Him for things in prayer in the name of Jesus. And God will give you what you ask for better than what you ask for. In fact, God will blow your mind away at what He'll do for you. Woo! John 15. He said, verse 16, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. And that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever, Here He says it again. Whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name... He may give it you. This is why you don't pray except you're going to pray in Jesus' name. Whether you say it at the beginning or the middle or the end, doesn't matter. You, you say it through Jesus Christ. You are guaranteed a blessing. John 16, 23. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, but, Now what are you saying? What did he say? You shall ask me nothing? You know why you wouldn't want to ask God for anything? We'll have everything. There's nothing to ask for. I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. Your problem is not that, you, that God hates you or that God won't answer your prayer. Your problem is you didn't ask God. One of the worst mistakes that I can make as a pastor... 
not the biggest mistake, but one of the bad mistakes that I can make as a pastor is to presume that God was in something when He wasn't. And I've made that mistake many times. Joshua found that out to be true. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, verse 25, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day you shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. In other words, you won't even have to speak in Jesus' name, because does not the Father already know what you need? Raise your hand if you've ever received an unprayed for blessing. I've got millions of them. The fact that you woke up this morning is an unprayed for blessing. A better blessing would be if you died in your sleep last night. Amen. Now that one was prayed for. God, let me die in my sleep tonight, please. Woo. Acts chapter 9, verse 13. This is when Saul, Paul, was converted on the Damascus Road. Jesus tells him to go find a man named Ananias. And he said, he's going to help you there. And so, Paul, Saul shows up. And Ananias is instantly fearful of him because he knows what Paul is coming to do. Paul was on his way to go arrest anybody who was a Christian and take them back and put them in jail. And have them tried and convicted and probably killed for being a Christian. So Ananias immediately is like, I I'm not dealing with this guy. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. How is it that we are known in this world? Will they know you at McDonald's when you sit down and before you take a bite out of that biscuit sandwich, you bow and you pray, God, bless this food. Thank you for it. I love you. Thank you for cleaning hogs so I could eat sausage and bacon. Amen. And in Jesus' name, amen. They will know you by the name of Jesus Christ. That is why they were called Christians in Antioch. Christians following the teachings of Christ. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me that bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Paul did. He, in fact, he listed all the things that had happened to him during his ministry. How many times he was beaten. How many times he was prisoned. How many times he was... They actually stoned Paul and left him for dead and thought he was dead. And his disciples, his, his saints... Came around him and they were going, oh, Paul, he's dead, he's dead, oh, he's dead. Paul's dead. And then Paul got up and went, oh. well, let's go somewhere else and preach. That's what happened. You read the Bible, that's what happened. Now, Romans 9, verse 16. I'm almost done. So that it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Number one, not only we have the word of God printed in hundreds of languages, spread throughout all the earth, so that everybody in their tongue would know the name of the Lord. Secondly, we've got Charlton Heston. Amen. I've raised thee up. Why did God raise Pharaoh up? So that his mighty power could be declared. As Pharaoh went to kill the Israelites, God opened up the Red Sea. In his name. Revelation 2.13 
Jesus said to the seven churches, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, this is Pergamos, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. You see what he said here? That the name of Jesus in you and your faith are one and the same. If you are ashamed of bearing the name of Christ and his reproach, then you do not have faith in the name of Jesus Christ. You don't believe in it, you don't have it. And God won't give it to you until you believe. Um, Revelation 3, 8, I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. What three times did Peter do the night that Jesus was being judged, the day before he was crucified. What did he do? He didn't just deny a man. He denied the man named Jesus Christ. He denied him. And God had mercy on him anyway. Don't deny young people. If God has saved you, when you go to school, don't be ashamed that you're a Christian. Don't be ashamed. You have nothing to be ashamed of. You know your school cannot stop you from praying over your meal? Do you know the school cannot stop you from reading the Bible? They can't stop you. And if they do, call me. Call me. I'd love to get in that one. They had, when Matthew went over here to Hillsboro, they had a day where they was going to celebrate all sodomites. It was gay day. And you had all these sodomites wearing t-shirts displaying the vulgarities of homosexuality and that boy that wore a dress over there went to the girls' locker room. And I called the school. And I asked them specifically, I said, and, and they said that they were not going to allow anybody to defame these students. I said, okay, let me ask you a question. I said, can I send my son to, tomorrow with a t-shirt that has scripture on it? If I send him to school tomorrow with a t-shirt that has Bible verse on it, are you going to kick him out? And she said, no, he has a right to his free speech. And I wish to God I could have had a t-shirt shop make me, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with a woman. It is abomination. And made him wear it. Like my mom made me wear ugly pants. <laughs> Don't deny the name of Jesus. Because that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Every saint and every angel and every devil is going to bow at the name of Jesus Christ one of these days. Therefore, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Somebody say amen. Amen. Let's bow. I'm done. And what a way to finish. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let me ask you a question this morning. Are you saved? Are you born again? And the gospel is so simple. I understood it when I was nine. Some children understand it when they're five. That they know the name of Jesus. They know he's the creator. They know he's the savior. They know he's God. And they know that their sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Have you called upon the name of the Lord? The thing that you desire most in your life after you're saved. Have you called upon the name of the Lord for it? Have you asked God in Jesus' name for it? Or are you afraid that maybe God won't answer your prayer and you'll be upset, you'll be hurt, you'll, be, you'll feel rejected and so you don't even dare pray it. Like the Shunammite woman gave up on wanting children until the man of God gave her a child. 
Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for these people this morning. I pray for the ones that are watching all over the world. Because everywhere in the world, people can call upon the name of Jesus. Now, God, we know that there are countries, North Korea, Afghanistan, where Christians face the harshest of penalties for proclaiming the name of the Lord. But they do so anyway because they know, especially in North Korea, that they, they are in bondage to that evil Kim family. And they know that if they called upon the name of the Lord openly, at best, they, would, they and their family would be thrown into a work prison. Or they would just be shot on sight. But Father, they are willing to risk even their very lives for not forsaking the name of Jesus Christ. God, help us in our darkest hour, in a time when all of our enemies have beset us round about, in the day where we fear that we will lose even our own lives, when they ask us, do you confess the name of Jesus or will you deny him? Father, give us the strength, if that day comes, to call upon the name of the Lord and not be ashamed. Father, I pray to your God that you would just fill these hearts with joy, inspiration, God, that you would give them something, Lord, to be thankful for. Something that in a righteous way to be proud of and never ashamed. Father, bless your people in the name and for the name of Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, Amen. Would you stand to your feet this morning?